God bless you, my brothers and sisters, and welcome again to Lessons from the Cutting Room Floor, where we share insights that weren't preached on Sunday. Or we share them in the study of the word that makes a more complete package of that presentation. Sunday was an awesome day, and I'll get to that in a minute, but let me just open by reminding all of you to be with us in church on Sunday. Be sure to be in the Lord's house as we start our African-American history presentation. It's going to be an interesting month. I don't want you to miss anything. Uh, I'll be preaching this Sunday, and I'm looking forward to seeing you. I think you'll be blessed by the word that God has to share for us. And the word is entitled, How Committed Are You? Just how committed are you? So be sure to be out. Now, you have to register for worship. So go to newsarmist.churchcenter.com and register for worship. Or just go to our website. Go to our website, www.newsarmist.org, and hit worship and sign up and be a part of worship. Be in the service. Everyone has to register during this season to be a part of worship. And we're wearing our African attire. Whether you're home sharing worship in your house or wherever, Wear your African attire. We're identifying with where we came from. It's going to be a great worship, and I look forward to seeing you. The, the website is going to carry all the things that are going on for the month because there's a lot going on in African American History Month. We're going to have a concert uh, with our HBCUs. We're going to have a Black History Institute running. All of that, you know, you'll see the dates and times. It's going to be major. So put it on your calendar. Be ready for it. It's going to be a real blessing. Well, now, today we're going back to the word that was shared on Sunday, it's coming from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and we start around verse 16. We'll start around verse 16. I mean, it was something in church Sunday. Oh, my God. I don't know if we can say we've ever been through something like that. God was moving by his spirit in such a mighty and powerful way. It was simply put awesome. It moved from, it morphed from a preaching moment to a prophetic declaration. And I want to help you understand the context in which Jesus stood and hopefully let you see the context in which this word was proclaimed to us. Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. Or really, let me back up to 14, because it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. Jesus starts out, as a solo ministry. He does not start out with 12 disciples or 500 uh, in his numbering band or 70 traveling along the road with him. He starts out singular. He starts out solo. He goes at this because he believes this is the will of God concerning him. He returns to Galilee. Remember, he left Galilee, and I'll be lifting up part of this story that backgrounds this verse on this coming Sunday. He leaves Galilee and goes down to the Jordan where he's baptized by John, has an experience in the wilderness, and then comes back up to Galilee. Now remember, the implication here is he is doing all of this solo. He is doing all of this solo. Now, and I need you to get this. He returns to Galilee 
in the power of the Spirit, in the dunamis of the Spirit. He returns. He's, he's making a solo trek. He is so aware of the changing of his destiny from a carpenter's son to the fulfillment of being the son of God, that he makes a solo trek to wrestle with all of what this means by himself and to step into the preparation for it to step in for the preparation for it, to have the valid credentials, not from earth, but from heaven. I've always believed this, and I've said it many times. There are some things you need to have validated to yourself. Jesus goes down to the Jordan where he's baptized by his cousin. John the Baptist is his cousin. And then he comes back to Galilee without any entourage. or anything. He's made a personal decision. Now, now, get this. No one talked him into it, and no one could talk him out of it. When persons come to see me about the call to preach or the call to ministry, or really about any of the situations in their lives, I try my best not to give them the answer. Why? Because if it goes wrong, who do they blame? They blame me. Faith is not about having someone to blame. Faith is about realizing you made the decision that you hang your hat on. Jesus goes down to, the, to Galilee by himself. We do not read of an entourage traveling with him. We do not read of brothers and sisters going with him. He goes by himself because there are things he must deal with by himself. Now, my brothers and sisters, let me, let me mark this for you. There are things you have to deal with by yourself. But notice the phrasing that I put here. There are means no way around it. Things, situations, issues, realities, circumstances. You have to deal with. You have to confront it. You have to face it. You can't just keep pushing it off and sloughing it off. You have to face it. You have to stand up to it. You have to meet it head on. You have to handle it. And you can't, you can't delegate it to another. This is something you have to do. There are changes that we have to make that cannot be left into the hands of others. Nor can we blame them nor complain that we didn't know what we were getting into. Jesus went by himself for that purpose so that he could wrestle it out himself. He could deal with it himself. He could face what he had to face himself. Now, news when he gets back spreads about him. Why? Because he has come back in the power of the Spirit. Now, a reality that we have to admit, we have to accept, the Spirit changes us. The Spirit changes us. It's like fabric softener. It changes us, takes off the hardening agents. It makes us vulnerable. It makes us susceptible, but it empowers us. We do not become like the soft shell crab, prey for every predator. We become like the champion of glory with the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We become prepared. He returns in the power of the Spirit. The power, which means the Spirit is not just an accompaniment. The Spirit brings empowerment. The Spirit is an agent of God to empower us an agent of God to empower us. And so the chapter, the chapter opens with these, or the, the pericope that we're looking at opens with words that are powerful. It says when he went to Nazareth after teaching in the synagogues, after having everyone praising him and recognizing 
that he's filled with the Spirit. What happens when he's filled with the Spirit? And he evidences it. News about him spread through the whole countryside. Now, somebody's got to get that plot. It is not that he is a great carpenter. It is not that he is able to fashion wood or that he was even one who was baptized by John in the Jordan or that he has a word. News spreads about him because he has returned in the power of the spirit. He has come back manifesting the spirit and having the spirit made manifest through him. My God, that line just blows my mind. The Spirit has led him into the Jordan. Now the Spirit is leading him home. And he is filled with the power of the Spirit. Whew. He returns in the power of the Spirit. And news about him gets out. News about him gets out. Everything that Mary has been told is going to come true because he is filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of God has descended on him like a dove and heaven has said, this is my beloved son. He is filled with the Spirit. And when he went and he goes into the synagogues teaching and everyone is praising him. In other words, he's making a journey on his way somewhere. And in Luke's presentation of Jesus' history, he is making his way back home to where it all began, to where he will get a glimpse of how he will be received. He is making his way back home to Nazareth. He is in the power of the Spirit. He has been in the cities of Galilee, in the towns, in the synagogues of Galilee. And now he has come back to Nazareth. He went to Nazareth. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue. You know, you have to picture this. Everything that Luke is describing in this opening section is about Jesus's enrapturement with the presentation of his relationship with God. He does it in the synagogue. He'll do it in the temple. But he is enraptured by the presentation of his relationship with God. Now, I've got to pause there because I need someone to understand how critical this is. Because this is the statement of who we really are. That we are so enraptured with who God is that we just want to present ourselves. Now, get what I'm going to say, what Paul says. As a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. We want people to see who we are in Christ and we want people to see who God is in us. It doesn't say he comes back home and he goes this place, he goes that place, and it just so happens that he stops. Him. No! Luke finds the relevance of Jesus' life right now as lived in his relationship to God. Is the relevance of your life caught up in your relationship to God. Is that what makes life relevant for you? And is that what makes your life relevant to others? That you are caught up, tied up, tangled up in your relationship with God. Is that what makes your life relevant to others? Luke is not positive. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole country. He was teaching in the synagogue, and everyone was praising him. He went to Nazareth, where he was brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. Luke doesn't deal with anything else. Now, of course, there were other things going on. But the thing that Luke says is gripping about Jesus, that gains him his notoriety, that initially launches his ministry is that he is filled 
with the power of the Spirit. And it is made manifest to those who reach, who see him and encounter him. Somebody got to get that. Let me ask you this question. Is that what's happening when people are encountering you? And I have to ask myself, is that what's happening when people are encountering me? Or are there, if someone were to write your story in mind, is there so much other extraneous material that somebody might think the emphasis and the important part of our life is somewhere other than our relationship with God? Jesus so lived it, lived it that when Luke wrote his prologue and said, the former things, O Theopolis, as he was talking about Acts, when he wrote in Acts, the former things, O Theopolis, I wrote unto thee about how, what Jesus began to do and to teach. Would somebody say, oh, no, well, church, Christ, kingdom, it was important to him, but not that important. You know, he was more into some other stuff. You know, he liked his job. He liked um, hanging out. He liked carousing. You know, he loved the Lord, but he also loved the honeys. He loved, she loved Christ, but, you know, she loved men too. Um, you know, whatever. Is there something else? Or would someone, someone in writing your history find those other things, not the most definitive things of helping to understand you? Luke says, to understand Jesus, you have to go back to this line. In the power, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit. That God who is Spirit is so wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in him. That God's essence and isness is in him. And he goes all over sharing this marvelous presentation of the spirit being in him. I don't know about anybody else, but when I read that line, I had to pause. The spirit, the ruah of God and the, the power of the spirit is all over him, the power of God's spirit, the ruah. In Hebrew, that would be called the ruah. In, in the Greek, it is the pneuma, the breath of God, the breathing of God. Now, here's the term I want you to use. The God's life force is in him. God's life force is in him, the spirit, the ruah, the breath of God, the blowing, the, the ruah of God is in him. God, that makes me shout almost to think about it. the life force of God dwells in Jesus. Paul would later say the fullness of the Godhead bodily rests in him. He is the image of the invisible God. And the spirit of God has taken up residency in this human being, this man of flesh. Just an aside, Luke declared, or rather Paul declared that he was the Messiah at his resurrection. Mark said he is the Messiah, he is the son of God, and we're made aware of it at his baptism when the dove descends upon him. Matthew and Luke say, oh no. He is the son of God when Mary is spoken to and told that she's going to give birth to a son and his name will be called Jesus and he'll save his people from their sins and he shall be the son of the highest for the spirit of God shall come over you and you shall conceive a child. That that's when he, this all happens. But John, the Rev, John, the gospel writer says, oh, no, it's even before that. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Spirit of God was in him at his even before the beginning of time. God's spirit was moving in the word. So the point of tension here or the point that we have to get is that Jesus intentionally chose for his life to be identified with the spirit. 
And the question to those who follow him, is that the choice you've made too? To be intentionally identified with the spirit of God living in you. If that be so, let me just ask you this. What are the signs of it? What are the signs? And write it in the chat. What are the signs of the spirit of God living in you? Somebody said, well, I, I, I got a new car, I got a house. No, that's just a sign that you were able to get a loan. That's just a sign you had enough money to get a car. But what are the signs of the spirit of God living in you? When Jesus went across the countryside and was teaching in the synagogues, what were the signs that the spirit of God was alive in him that caused everyone to start praising him? So now he's in Nazareth. He goes to Nazareth where he's been brought up. This is the, the and Nazareth is not some little uh, two by uh, four town. Nazareth is a serious, significant place. It has some size to it. It is a place of significance. And, and Jesus has gone back to his hometown. It's not some little small two by four village. He's gone back to his place of origin, come back to where he's grown up. And there on the Sabbath day, the Jewish day of worship, he goes into the synagogue to worship. Now get this, as was his custom. I, I, Luke is not leaving anything out. He's telling us he's going by himself back and forth. He tells us when he gets back, he is confident that he is coming back in the power of the spirit and it is operating through him. Luke is telling us that news gets out about him before he's done hardly any great things. He hasn't fed 5,000, hasn't walked on water. But news is getting out about him. Why? Because he is filled with the Spirit. And God does his own advertising for folk who are filled with the Spirit. Write that down. God does his own advertising for folk who are filled with the Spirit. God brings great people to you. A man's gift will make room for him and bring him before great people. But understand, God will also bring people to you. When the ways of the man please God, God will bring people to you. And news about him spread throughout the countryside, the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone was praising him. His, his fame is going up. Why? Because when you're filled with the Spirit, God will advertise for you. God, God will be your influencer. God will be the influencer. He will send people, quote unquote, to your website. He will send people to come see what you're offering. And so he brought people to see Jesus. He goes to Nazareth where he's grown up, where everybody knows him as Mary and Joseph's son. And there are those who make mockery of that and others who speak highly of that. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. Now, now that's pressing for me. You know, I tell you, this is lessons from the cutting room floor. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. <clears throat> Jesus is born with a, with a cloud of mystery over him. Mary has said that she is with child, and Joseph knows it's not his. And Mary is saying, it's the child I'm conceived of is by the Holy Ghost. Nobody believed that. Sure enough, not Joseph. How do you know that? Joseph didn't believe that. Because the next couple of verses, Joseph was getting ready to put her away. In other words, he was going to end the engagement quietly so that she would not be embarrassed. But instead, an angel speaks to him and tells him that what Mary is carrying is of the Holy Spirit. Now, what kind of angel that was, I do not know. In the sense of what the angel looked like, how he was dressed, or how he was able to convince Joseph of that, I do not know. Was it some ethereal creature? Was it a, a well-meaning friend? Was it? I don't know. But Joseph believed it and Joseph acted upon it. But it doesn't mean everybody in town did. It doesn't mean that everybody in the neighborhood did. 
It doesn't even mean that the contemporaries of Jesus did. It is very conceivable that Jesus could have been talked about, put, put upon. He could have been ridiculed, laughed at. And the last place he probably would have wanted to go may have been the sanctuary. But notice what the text says, as was his custom. Regardless of what his life was taking him through, his father dies on one occasion and, you know, he's left with the shop. He's got to take care of the family. He does what? He goes to the temple, to the synagogue, as was his custom. He sought answers and sought fellowship with God, regardless of circumstances and situations. Most persons now put God on the chopping block when situations and circumstances become tough. Jesus teaches just the opposite. When such a situation and circumstances become tough, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Thou shalt be my resting place. Thou hast been my hiding place. Jesus goes as was his custom because this is where he went to find the strength to live the life he had. This is where he goes. And he stood up to read. Now, interestingly enough, he didn't just walk in, walk up to the pulpit and start reading. No, someone, some one of the laymen were normally selected to read passages or to give explanation and interpretation thereof. Chances are this is not the first time this has happened to Jesus. He is not a novice in this. This is not his first exposure. This is not his first rodeo going to the, the synagogue. But this time when he enters, he's asked to come and share the reading. And the service normally had prayers and the reading of the Torah. That's the Old Testament scriptures of Moses, the Torah, the law. And, and then in the middle portion, they would also read from the prophets. And then there would be a homily, an explanation, and maybe even a testimony statement. A certain person in the synagogue would come and give the scroll, bring the scroll, and the scroll would be read. The scroll would be rolled out and a passage would be found, and that scroll would be read among the heroes. And so this is the worship service that Jesus is in. He is, I need you to write in the chat, Jesus went to church. Write that in your chat, Jesus went to church. And the Kazan would find a scroll, because they didn't have Bibles like we have with chapters and verses and scriptures and, and the New Testament, rather the Old, the New Testament bound, and they didn't have a message or a New Living Translation or a NIV version, they had the scrolls that were copied over and over and over and over. And whenever there was going to be, they, the scroll was taken out and given to the person reading. The scroll was taken out, the scroll of Isaiah, which implies, and it was, Jesus opened it to this passage. He opens it he scrolls that. Now remember, we don't have Bibles like what you and I are looking at. He doesn't do this. He doesn't stand there and grab his Bible and say, let me see the passage I want. Uh, let me see where it is. I'm looking for the 60-some chapter of Isaiah. Uh, I'm looking for 61st chapter, verse 1. No, he doesn't do that. He rolls it open, and he finds what he wants. He finds the passage that is normally read on Yom Kippur, the, 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 the Day of Atonement. He finds the passage that is normally lifted during the um, time, the year of Jubilee. The Jubilee is the 50th year when all Jews who were held in captivity could go back. You know, if you were a slave, you, were, you went back to being free. Whatever land was confiscated went back to who it was owned. This was the year of freedom. And so this is the passage that is normally read at that time. He rolls it out. The Kazan rolls it out, gives it to Jesus who's looking for it. He finds the passage he wants. And it says this. Everyone in the synagogue, all the men are looking at him. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me 
to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart. That's what Isaiah scripture says, to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and the release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of the Lord, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. Now, all of that is in the passage in this 60th chapter, 61st chapter of Isaiah. But this is what he reads <clears throat> as he stands up. Or well, the Kazan reads out, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the, for the prisoners and the recovery of sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he stops and he stops. He doesn't read all of the other passage, you know, the part that says, and to the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. No, he stops right there. He stops at that very special spot. It blows my mind that he does that because all of that seems like it's necessary to get across the idea that Isaiah is conveying. But the reality of it is he wants to get across not this fullness of what the day of Jubilee is, but he wants to get across what God is doing at this particular moment and what God is doing in and through him. Oh God, somebody's got to get this. This passage is about what God is doing in and through him. Because the verse says, let me read you the next verse. Then he rolled up the scroll, rolled it up, gave it back to the attendant, the Kazan, and sat down, sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, did he preach some more? Was that all he said? Notice what the text says, because often we have what I call um, historical historical remembrance of what is not historical. The text says, he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So we don't know the rest. We don't know the rest of what he said according to Luke. He made his point right there. He sat down, dropped the mic, sat down and said this day, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is about letting you know, not about the day. All there is to know about the day of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee, the moment. It's about letting you know who I am and who it is that's speaking to you. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Somebody's got to get that. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He wants them to realize. I'm coming to my hometown. I want you all to know. That I've come back filled with the power of God. The spirit. And, and what does the spirit do? Because he's telling you what he's going to do. He says, I've come to do something amazing and mighty in your midst. I've been anointed to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to, for the prisoners, cover your sight for the blind, to the, set the oppressed free, and to proclaim to each of you the year of the Lord's favor. And how, how will I accomplish this mighty, ma ma this mighty assignment? I will accomplish it through the power of the Spirit 
because I am anointed. I am set aside for this. I am set aside to have the Spirit empower my words to accomplish things in the lives of others. I am set aside for the Spirit to utilize whatever is at my disposal to accomplish what God wants done through me in the lives of those who hear what I say and are a part of what I do. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, remember, this is a blueprint for all of us who would follow in his path. This is a blueprint. Is that what you want? Do you want to be identified as spirit-filled? And do you want that understood by those around you to mean that God has so chosen you and empowered you with his spirit so that you can accomplish things in the lives of others? using whatever is at your disposal in that moment to the glory of Almighty God. Is that what you want to be known for? Whether you're a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a mathematician, a secretary, a, a, a counselor, a guide, a preacher, do you want to be known as one who is who the Spirit empowers to be in the plan of God in such a way that whatever is at your disposal, the spirit empowers to have life, to bring change into those around you. So that as Jesus speaks words over people, their lives are changed. As he speaks words over people. Remember I told just the other week, he told some lepers, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. His words took on life. Woman, your faith has made you whole. His words had brought people life. Two fish and five barley loaves. But that's all that's in his hand. But he is anointed. The spirit of God hath anointed him so that whatever he's using will accomplish what God wants done. It will proclaim, it will declare, it will give, it will set free. It will do all of that, whatever is in his hands, two fish and five barley loaves. But the spirit will give it what it needs to accomplish what it must accomplish. Is that what you want to be known for? Or do you want to be known to be the life of the party, intellectual, cool, um, as a friend of mine said, suave and debonia, suave and debonair? Do you want to be known as that woman, that girl, that guy? Do you want people looking up to you as um, fashionable, um, somebody who's got it all together? It's amazing to me the people on the internet who want you to think they got it all together. Half of them want you to believe they got it all together because then they know if they have succeeded at that, they've succeeded at everything. They don't have it together. They don't have it together. They are presenting an image. Jesus had it together. In his nothingness of neighborhood, in his poverty of possessions, he becomes the absolute greatest influencer of all time. The absolute greatest influencer of all time. Why? Because it was his will to let everyone know that he was filled with the Spirit. And so that when people saw him, they saw the image of the invisible God. When they heard him, they heard the voice of God. When they prayed, they knew he would hear their prayer. Woo, I get caught up just thinking about that. He comes, he wants us to realize that the spirit, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. He has set me apart. He has filled me in such a way that I can accomplish things in the lives of others. 
that whatever I'm using, whatever is at my disposal, metaphors, words, pictures, things can be used to accomplish whatever he wants done. I need somebody to get that. I need you to write it down. That's what I want. I want people to know me as being spirit filled and spirit led. This is a new day. It's a new day. It's not a day where we just go to church or come to church. This is the day. This is the hour of visitation. This is the hour of miracles. This is the day. Oh, somebody needs to hear this. This is the day when the Lord is saying to us, it's not about image. It's about substance. I need you filled with me. I don't need you quoting Tom, Dick, and Harry. I don't need you posting stuff you heard somewhere else and you trying to sound grand when you say it. I need you filled with my spirit so that I can take the simplest things you say and make them come alive in the hearts and lives of your hearers so that it becomes transformative and life-changing for them because the spirit of the Lord is upon you. You've heard me say this before, and I, I use this statement a lot, that the same power that was at work in Jesus is now at work in you. Notice what he says. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. He has anointed me. He has put the oil on me. He has made me Obvious, he has shown his selection in me. I have been anointed. I have been filled by his spirit to do his will. Notice how he says he's anointed me. And to do what? To proclaim. To proclaim the Lord's word. To proclaim the good news. Now, the word proclaim in the Greek really, I'm not going to say really means, helps us to understand, in the English it'll say proclaim. The Greek also means communicate. And now when you say communicate, this is what I want you to get. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to get the point across about good news to the poor, to get the point across of good news to the poor who have been pushed down, knocked down, kept down, the people who are least prone to believe that there is a way, as my pastor, Dr. Harold A. Carter used to say, who've been down so long, getting up ain't on their mind, to communicate the good news. See, we think about proclaim and we think a one way street. But Jesus is communicating it to them in such a way that they accept it. If your if your proclamation is over folks heads, you're not living out this passage. He's communicating the good news to people who don't normally get good news who aren't accustomed to dialing in on this frequency. I love how that's there because he has given me the special power to have my words make sense to people who, are, who normally would not be able to receive or grasp this. Some, something would stand in the way of them receiving or grasping this. But because I am filled with his spirit, I'm empowered by him. My words take on a different dimension and I can communicate with people who normally, get what I'm going to say, don't understand this language. Who know, that, that's what blew the disciples' mind when they came out preaching on the day of Pentecost communicating on the day of Pentecost because folk understood in their own language. They understood what these guys were saying. 
quote unquote, in their own language. They made sense to them. The glossolalia, we always think of it as just the unknown tongue, but it's communicating in a way that makes sense to somebody in, a, in, in the language that the somebody understands. I, I could talk about some things and I'd be using my language and you, you'd be sitting there like, huh, what's he talking about? But he communicates. He has sent me to communicate, to communicate good news to the poor. Good news, life-changing news to the folk in poverty and who are really destitute. Who are destitute. Now, now get this. The way this word is used, to the poor, it's not talking about somebody who was poor once. It's talking about people who are in a continuous state of poverty. In a continuous state of power, who, who haven't been able to look forward to, as Dr. Carter said, who've been down so long, getting up ain't even on their mind. But Jesus is anointed to proclaim that. Are you anointed to proclaim? Are you anointed to communicate in a language that the person with whom you are communicating can understand the good news of Jesus Christ? He has sent me to communicate freedom, freedom for the captives, freedom, liberation for the captives. Now, now what's interesting is how this is used. He has sent me to communicate, now get this where it says freedom. I want you to put this. He has sent me to communicate the process for your liberation the process for your freedom. He has sent me to help you understand how you're going to be free, what it's going to take to be free. Not just to say, you're free. No, 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 no. Because, number one, talking, go back to the poor. You've been down so long, you, you, that just doesn't even make sense. You know, you... you you have to have a frame of reference to get there. So I've got to communicate the process of your deliverance. It may be that it starts with a word. It may be that it starts with this or that, a testimony. Even the man at the gate, when Peter and John said, we don't have no money, but look on us. And the man looked and he walked in. Remember the man, uh, Jesus said, uh, when the disciples asked who sent he was, Parents and Jesus said neither, but that the glory of God might be revealed and Jesus healed him and then he shouted on into the temple. Somebody said, well, well where's the process there? You got to understand, Jesus had been healing and doing miracles. People had begun to believe that if he said it, it could happen. The process has to begin. And so he's, he sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners. He sent me to talk about the process of setting free. He sent me to be the agent of liberation, to, to begin to enter into this liberating process for the prisoners, to let you know you coming out. He sent me to proclaim, you coming out. Well, I ain't out yet, but you coming, baby, you coming. How many of you made a, two steps forward and had to make one step back sometime. You coming out. You coming out. But it's a process. You coming out. You got to get up and walk past jailers like Simon Peter did. First, I got to get you to get up and then go through the door and then walk past the jailers. And then finally you realize I really am out. To sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and the recovery of sight for the blind. To let people who were blind see again. See again. And, and he may even been talking about folk for the first time seeing. Part of me likes the see again because it can morph from physical sight to life sight, to spiritual sight. Some folks saw, but what they saw hurt them so much they became blind. 
But in Jesus Christ, he will give you back your sight so that you can once again see the wonders of life. Some folk were born without the capacity to be able to see the light, without the capacity to see what God could do. They, they, they just didn't see it. They didn't grow up in an environment of it. it, it it's like folk who don't understand Christmas because they didn't grow up in Christmas or don't understand birthdays because they weren't celebrated when they were growing up. But, but then they're able to recover sight and see what they've missed and see what they want to look forward to. The recovery of sight for the blind. The recovery of sight for the blind. Now they can see. Now they have their vision back. Wow. Recovery of sight of the blind. To set the oppressed free. Now, wait a minute. One would read this and imagine a million tools that are necessary. I mean, you're going to need a lot to do all this, Jesus. Jesus said, no. That's the power of the anointing, to give life to whatever you're using so that it affects the change in the lives of the people it's sent to. Remember, Jesus is the word. The word. He is the word. Somebody, I need you to write that down. He is the word. He is the word. And the word... Oh, God, God, sometimes it make you shout just thinking about it. The word will not return to him void. That was his statement. The word would not return to him void, but would accomplish whatever he sent it out to do. Anybody remember that? For my word shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish wherever I have sent it. This is what he said. He's getting us to realize. Somebody said, well, I thought he needs all. No, no, no. Just the word is enough. He speaks and men live. Bats his eye and lightning flashes. He claps his hand and thunder rolls. His ability to speak these words, this word, and the word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. That word. There was nothing made that was not made by him. In him was everything made that was made. He speaks and it comes alive. Have you ever heard a sermon that came alive in you? The words just seem to leap off the page. Let me see if I can get something for context too. Sunday, you know, every week I preach what is the word of God, putting it in the context of where it was uttered and hoping to give you interpretation for how it can be used now. But Sunday was, in a sense, prophetic pronouncement. It, it means it didn't need a context from the past because it was spoken directly to you in the present by one whom God had anointed so that that word came alive in you in that moment. Jesus opens up by giving credit to God. It, hey, this ain't me. This is not my flesh. This is the spirit of God speaking. And so that announcement brought life to you. It said it proclaimed, oh, the good news to the poor. It proclaimed freedom for those who were in prison. God, it was the recovering of sight to the blind. It was the recovering of sight to the blind. It was that which set the oppressed free spoken directly into individuals' lives. Is that who you want to be known as? Somebody said, well, they spoke a word, they this, they that. This is not something you manufacture or whatever. This is God using you for someone else's purpose, for some other purpose. Not you. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do something. To do what? What's he's anointed me to do? To, to communicate good news to the poor. To proclaim freedom for the prisoners. To talk about the recovery of sight. To give the sight back to people who can't see. To set the oppressed. Those who've been crushed under the feet of others. To set them free. 
to set them free. Well, what are all these tools? How's he going to do it? What's he, what, where's he going to get it from? From just speaking that word. Speaking that word. <whistles> to set the oppressed free. Is that what you want to be known for? Or do you want to be known for something else? Jesus says, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You are seeing the person who is the living embodiment of this. Now, my question to you is, can you say this around your friends and sit down and they say, and then say, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It's coming to pass in your, your hearing. I'm the living embodiment of it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to do this. And, and the initial reaction of folk, he rolls up the scripture and sits down. And they say, isn't this Joseph's son? Verse 22, all spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his lips. Will people receive that from you? Will they sense the continuity between, or the authenticity between what you said and who you are? Even if they don't fully grasp, fully grasp what it means to have the spirit of the Lord in you, will they at least conclude, I see the consistency in that. And then he hits this last one, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. <laughs> to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That this is the season of God's favor. The Lord's favor on your life that God is going to be moving in powerful, productive ways in your space to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I got, I got caught right there Sunday in that prophetic announcement, proclaiming uh, and declaring the year of the Lord's favor. I got caught right there proclaiming to the people in the congregation, both virtual and physical, the Lord's favor. Being filled with the spirit to proclaim to people, for them to hear in their nowness, in the right now of the moment, the word of the Lord, God's voice to them, breaking apart all of the encasement of their freedom, all of the encasement of their liberty, all of the encasement of their opportunity, and setting them free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And what was doing it? The Word. The Word was declaring unto people that this is the year of the Lord's favor. This is your year of jubilee. This is the year God does it all for you. It may not be on the calendar as such, but this is the year it's going to happen. And it was being declared as spoken by God. People didn't hear me talking to them. They heard it as the voice of God speaking to them. They heard God talking to them. It just happened to be my mouth and lips and voice. But they heard it as God. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And another, they will not follow. They heard it because it took on life. It was no longer just words and syllables. Sometimes life seems like words and music that can't quite become a song. No, they heard it as the voice of God speaking to them, creating while it was speaking, empowering while it was speaking. And all they could conclude was, I'm being filled with the spirit. Oh, my God, my time is up. I got to end, brothers and sisters. I could go longer. The title of the sermon was supposed to be, I feel the spirit moving 
in my heart. I feel the spirit was the title of the sermon, but where it's moving all in my life and in my consciousness so that I can do fully, brilliantly, and completely all God has called me to do. And that because his anointing is on us, that spirit takes whatever we're using and gives life to it, gives life to it so that it can live in the life of the one to whom it is directed. That's why God can use you to say some things that others have no effect when they say it. God can use you to do some things, and when others do it, it's just passe. In fact, people get angry and upset, but because the Spirit of the Lord gives what you use life for the person you're using it for, and they hear it, they receive it, they understand it in an altogether different way. They may not even understand it came from God, but it creates life in them. And through life, they come to know him. Well, our time is up. I got to end. Our class time is up. Oh, we had a good class today. I hope somebody received a revelation from God. But above all, I hope you decide, you decide to start saying, I want to live so and walk so that I'm identified as one who is filled with the Spirit and that whatever I use... Whatever God has put at my disposal, he uses through me to create life in it through the power of the spirit so that it blesses to whomever it is sent. For the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, set me aside to do these things. He has set me aside to accomplish this work. I like how the message says, and I close it with this. God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and the recovery of sight of the blind, to set the burden and battered free, and to announce this is God's year to act. Well, my brothers and sisters, Act on everything you've heard God say to you. Remember, this is Black History Month, African American History Month, and we're wearing our African attires every Sunday this month at home, wherever you are, wear your African attire. Worship with us Sunday. Go to New Psalmist website and sign up to be in worship on Sunday morning, www.newpsalmist.org. And you can give your offerings there too, along with Push Pay and Givelify, and you can mail your offering to the church. But this is a great season, a lot going on. Here's the question I want you to wrestle with this week. I want you, as you'll see it Sunday as we broadcast, as we go in worship. But here's the question. You get a head start on it. Why is it necessary for every generation to continue the struggle for liberation, equality, and equity in our world? Why is it essential that every generation pick it up and struggle? Now, I invite you to, to have this conversation with your family members, your friends, your co-workers, wherever you can. Don't let it get into an argument, or whatever, but just why it's important that we never give up. We never quit. We keep on going. Jesus died on the cross, and yet the work keeps on going. Martin King was murdered on a Memphis balcony. The work keeps on going. Medgar Evers was shot in the driveway. The work keeps on going. Why is it necessary for us to be a part of that work? Send us some of your responses. Send them to amen at newsalmist.org, and we'll post some of them on Sunday um, but as we're rolling the scrolls on Sunday morning, we'll post some of them on our website. We'll even have conversations about them. Keep in mind that throughout the month, the website's going to carry everything we're doing. We're having a concert near the on the last Sunday, I think it is, with our HBCUs. They're going to do a concert for us. That's going to be exciting. I can't wait for that. It's going to be virtual. A HBCU concert. We have communion Sunday and we close the month with our concert. Then we're going to have a, um, a, a, a great black history um, teach-in. We used to call them teach-ins when I was in school. But it's going to be a black history university. Things you didn't learn in school 
over four nights. Be sure to watch out for it. It's at the end of the month. That's going to be an event you don't want to miss. The website will carry all the books that we're reading, articles and things that you can look at. We're going to have a movie night together. We're having a movie night together. Friday night, movie night. Our, our, our ministry here is going to be fixing food. You can order your food here, get your dinners here. Then we're going to all be watching the same movie virtually at home. Bring your friends over to your house, set it up. However you do, we're going to have it together. That's going to be our movie night, our virtual movie night. And we're going to have an interesting time sharing the movie. We're going to be learning facts. It's going to be a great time. It's not the only time this year we're doing it. This is launching us into our learning experience. So go to the website and look up everything that's happening. Now, you should have got an email probably yesterday or today that outlines all of this. If you didn't get it, send us an email at amen at newsomers.org. And that'll let us know that somehow you either registered incorrectly or not registered in our database. And we want you to make sure you get in. So send all of that to us if you don't get the email that spells out everything for Black History Month. But it's going to be a time. I'm preaching Sunday and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the house. So let's prepare to give our offerings. Ushers, let's collect our offering. You can use GiveLify or PushPay. You can go to the website. You can use text to give 77977 in the message line. Put NPBC space dollar sign and the amount. Or you can mail your offerings to New Psalmist Baptist Church, 6020 Marion Drive, Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. Let us know that Bible class is blessing your life. Let us know that. In the chat, um, talk about what we are teaching and what idea is coming across. We say a lot of hellos, but drop the nuggets that are sticking with you as we go through Bible class. Send it out to your friends. Let other people you know get engaged in the word and show them that you're filled with the spirit. Well, let's close in a word of prayer. Love all of you much. Keep all of the families and the church in prayer. And all of those who are working to try to get us through this COVID experience. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you thanking you for the word and what it means in our lives. Now, God, help us to be all you want us to be. Grow us in faith and grow us in the word. And Lord, let it be said of us. And we returned and we went and we showed up in the power of the spirit. Let that be what folk understand to be how we represent in the power of the Spirit. Remind us of that every place and everywhere we go, that we represent you and you are made manifest through us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my brother, my sister. See you Sunday morning. Register. Be sure to register for service, and I'm going to be looking for you either online or in the house. God bless you. Good night. <laughs>